Welcome to COVID-19 Fertility Empowerment Podcast. I'm your host, Panta Kalhor. Episode 16, Pandemic Effect on Fertility with Dr. Carol Lori, naturopath doctor, acupuncture, homeopath, and functional medicine expert. Please subscribe to Panta Kalhor Transition Channel and pre-order my book, Naturally Conceived, through Amazon. Thank you for watching. Welcome to COVID-19 Fertility Empowerment Podcast. I'm your host, Panta Kalhor. And everybody these days talking about naturopath, acupuncture, homeopath, and functional medicine. Especially during this COVID-19, people are researching about these topics. And women really wish to know about these if they haven't started practicing them or they haven't started any treatment with them. Today, we have very special guest, Dr. Carol Laurie, and she has all of these things together, and I'm really surprised. And that's why I was so excited to talk to her uh, because she's. Uh, she has experience over three decades of clinical uh, experience as a naturopath, acupuncturist, homeopath, functional medicine, everything together. So welcome to our podcast, Lori. Thank you so much. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited to talk with you and your community. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so how did you end up to go to naturopath? And uh, please give, give us some distinction between them because my audience asked me about functional medicine. These days, especially, everybody talk about this. And I really wish to know what's the difference between uh, homeopath, functional medicine, naturopath, can you talk about this? And uh, first of all, before going through this, tell me about yourself and how you end up to have this package. Okay, well, that's a lot of things to talk about. So um, first I'll start with myself and how I ended up with this package. Um, I always wanted to be a doctor. And when I was growing up, the phrase doctor usually referred to a white man in a white coat. Um, So that was a long time ago. Thank goodness things have changed a lot since then. But uh, the term doctor meant going to medical school. And I had planned on going to medical school. I did my undergraduate degree at Temple University in Philadelphia. And then I moved to New York and I was part of a spiritual community after I graduated. And my roommate had cancer. And I went with her to Memorial Sloan Kettering and heard her doctor say to her, "Uh, we've given you a ton of radiation. There's nothing more we can do for you. And let's see if it comes back and how quickly, et cetera. She was in her 20s and decided that that was not going to be her fate. And she sought out a chiropractor who was doing detoxifying diets using iridology. Now, you have to understand, this was in 1976, and nowadays the word detoxifying or detox is like part of every family's vocabulary. It's in television commercials, it's on print ads, we all know that word. But in 1976 or 77, nobody had heard of the word detox or detoxifying. It was like, what is that? So I went with her to the doctor and he looked in her eye and he said, oh, this is what, and he used the eye as a map to diagnose what was going on in her organ systems. That was a very advanced method, but really this is part of the eclectic system of healing that has been around before medicine was co-opted by the pharmaceutical company. And she started doing his protocol, which was 
juicing and eating something called a blended salad and eating very specific ways and basically being a vegetarian. And she started to spit up this black stuff from her lungs, which we took to a lab and it was um, evaluated and found to contain certain metals of the chemotherapy that she had and radiation that she had received. So that was really the beginning of my introduction to the power of uh, natural medicine and natural healing. And I ended up working in this doctor's office for a, about six months. And when I first started working there, this is how naive I was. A young woman came in and she had very bad skin. And in my brain, I'm thinking, okay, you have bad skin. You just go on antibiotics, you know, tetracycline, 250 milligrams a couple times a day forever, and you're going to be fine. So now, goodness, I would hope ne nobody would ever do that. But she went on his protocol, and a month later, she came back for her checkup, and her skin was clear. She had lost all this weight. She felt much better. And I saw this happen all again, time and time, with the rejects of people that had either not been helped through regular allopathic medicine or who had been really severely messed up through allopathic medicine. And I really began to think that maybe this natural healing was like, oh, maybe this is something. And then as the universe takes care of you, one day I was going through this huge pile of magazines and newspapers that was in the doctor's office and there was a catalog to the National College of Naturopathic Medicine. And it was like a lightning bolt happened and I went, hmm, maybe I should go here. So that is how I ended up going to Portland, Oregon, driving from Philadelphia to leaving my home. It was not an easy thing to leave home and my mom and my community and drive cross country to strangers in a new world, in a new, the east, the wet, from the East Coast to the West Coast. You can tell I have not lost my Philadelphia accent all these years later. And I uh, learned about natural medicine. And then I moved to California and I got my acupuncture license. And I always had been studying homeopathy while a student at NCNM. And I've continued that because of all the modalities, homeopathy has the ability to really heal on such a deep level that I feel it's uh, one of the wonderful, most wonderful healing modalities available. But now with what we have now, with what we're facing now, um, the difference between functional medicine mm -hmm. and naturopaths, naturopathic physicians and homeopaths. So anyone can be a functional medicine practitioner. You can be a medical doctor, a chiropractor, an osteopath. You can be a lay um, clinical nutrition person who is a functional medicine practitioner. And the approach of that, there are several different functional medicine universities that people can attend. There's the Institute of Functional Medicine, which is where I've taken my courses, but there are lots of other universities out there and they do offer online programming. And Functional medicine and naturopathic medicine are very similar in that naturopaths believe that and practice that you want to heal from the inside out and you want to get to the root cause of the dis-ease or the dysbiosis or the cellular disorganization that's creating the symptoms and the illness that the person is presenting. And in my practice, that includes a lot of looking at what are the emotional components of illness or disease. Um, and as far as what is a homeopath, homeopathy is its own system of healing. You can be a medical doctor, you can be an osteopath, you can be a dentist, you could be a therapist, you can be a lay homeopath, but you have to have studied uh, homeopathic medicine and there are thousands of homeopathic remedies, and it uh, takes a long time to really learn how to listen and figure out what the body and the mind are saying. Now, the beauty of homeopathy is that three people can have the same diagnosis. Let's just say Hashimoto's thyroiditis. 
But when you begin to talk to each individual person, you will find out that some one woman or one woman or man likes heat better. Another person likes cold better. Another person doesn't care. One person has gained weight. One person has lost weight. One person has lost their appetite. What, I mean, the symptoms of the person are taken into account, not the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So as a homeopath, we're, the interview can be hours because we're always asking these very minute questions that people say to me, no one has ever asked me that before. What the heck is that about? And dreams are very important. So it's not like therapy, but we need to get a whole symptom picture of how your body, your mind, and your spirit are impacting you to present with a certain illness. And then we repertorize these symptoms and we find a remedy which most closely matches how you're presenting your symptoms. I love that distinction. <laughs> Thank you. I was really surprised to know all of this. That's great. And you also use acupuncture for your patients, right? I do. Acupuncture in Chinese medicine has been around for 5,000 years. So mm -hmm. I think uh, there must be something to it if it's managed to last all these years. And especially right now with all this COVID and viral and immune system fear and anxiety happening, I think acupuncture in Chinese medicine, in addition to the beauty of natural medicine, herbs and botanicals and supplements, can add a lot of input to taking care of a woman's fertility as well as being aware of how to support her immune system during this pandemic. Mm. So let's say if a woman come to, comes to you and ask for a remedy, she can't get conceived, she is struggling with the fertility issues, and have has a lot of recurrent miscarriages what do you recommend okay well in my practice i offer comprehensive individual workup so first of all i'm assuming she's been to her obgyn so we need to look at her blood work we need to see what's going on there Often I find that as a functional medicine practitioner or as a naturopath, not enough inflammatory markers have been done for the woman. So I will order additional blood work. Um, I want to look at what she's eating. I would look at, do a Chinese oriental diagnostic workup. Is her abdomen cold or hot? Is her body cold or hot? Look at, looking at her thyroid to make sure she has optimal thyroid markers and that her thyroid is within the parameters to provide the energy to her body because sometimes the problem is that the woman has undiagnosed Hashimoto's or just regular hypothyroidism and that is contributing towards her inability to conceive and multiple miscarriages. What is her diet like? How does she eat? What is her nutritional status? And there are very specialized functional medicine labs that I can utilize to really get a clear black and white picture of where she is with her zinc levels, with her protein, with her uh, cholesterol, with her vitamin C and her D, nutritionally, not just through her serum blood work. That's extremely important. And lastly, and it shouldn't be last, sometimes I really feel like it should be first, is what is her emotional and spiritual stress level like? Is she connected to herself? Is she feeling a huge amount of burden and stress? Uh, is this pregnancy wanted, really? Or does she have some conflicting feelings about that? What is the truth for her without any judgment of, well, yes or no, or good or bad? Just where is she and her partner uh, with this. And hopefully there, are, you know, if there are two people, we need to bring in both people sometimes into the conversation. And it, is it a lesbian couple or is it two men or is it a straight couple? And we want to optimize the health of all parties involved. Wow. 
I could write a chapter with your works, really. It's amazing. Like this is the whole picture of a body. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just reproductive function. and It's not just the power of fertility. You have to look at her as a whole body. That's what acupuncture and traditional medicine do as well. But as you said, with the functional medicine, you also send them for additional blood work additional testing and those points that uh, you said is really is a chapter it's well, thank amazing you. yeah i love it the woman is not just herself it's herself with her partner if she has a partner and it's herself and her partner within society and so we need to look at the entire macrocosm and then bring it down into smaller segments Mm -hmm. And what about liver? Because I see um, liver makes a lots of issue for fertility, and many women are not aware of this. Well, there's the liver as far as Chinese medicine is concerned, and then there's the liver as far as standard medical blood work is concerned. In Chinese medicine mm -hmm. and Oriental medicine, if you're if you get angry or stressed, the liver can get very tight. And when the liver gets tight, that create, can create blood stagnation and difficulty with the energy flowing smoothly in the body. Then there's regular allopathic medicine. And that has to do with, are your liver enzymes elevated? And do you have some kind of irritation in your liver? For example, are you drinking too much alcohol that's creating your liver to become irritated and then you get elevated liver enzymes? But that is a different, that's a different way of treatment of the liver. We have to look at if the woman is angry, if she's stressed out, and you can tell a lot about the liver through what does her period blood look like? And also th when we take the pulses in Chinese medicine, we can feel if the liver is tight uh, or stringy or stretchy when we take pulses in uh, liver Chinese medicine. Because uh, recently I had some irregular uh, uh, period mm -hmm. and uh, heavy and for a for few months I had problem. Mine was always regular. And I did the blood work, um, I did the ultrasound, everything looks good. But the problem is still there. So I, right. I, was, I was surprised, what, what should I do with this? Then I went to acupuncture, the one. Perfect. Yeah, the one who actually cured my pregnancy problem. And because I think there should be something in place right now, even in OBs even in Western medicine, they should look at the body as a picture, the whole picture. Don't, they don't have to just look at your blood work, look at this, that is not enough. There is something. Right. It. And it was amazing. After one month, four visits of treatment, I was okay. Again, Perfect. I back to regular. So, and he said, you have liver problem. As you said, as I just getting back to words, probably, yeah, that was the issue. And that's, that's from Chinese medicine view. Right. So a lot of the times when people come into my practice, um, they'll say, I'm fine. And I go, what does that mean? Well, I've had an ultrasound. I've had lots of blood work. My thyroid, according to the blood work that was done, is fine. Um, I'm eating healthy, and then, you know, I start to dig, and their definition of fine and my definition of fine <laughs> is very different, and they aren't fine. And there is uh, a diagnosis in um, the DSM of Diagnostic Manual of Unexplained Infertility, and the majority of times in my practice and in my world of functional medicine and Chinese and Oriental medicine, there's always a reason it's just that sometimes it hasn't been you haven't dug enough um i had a, a lovely woman who 
kept having recurrent miscarriages. Mm -hmm. And finally, I said, you know, you need to have in a, a biopsy of your uterus to see if there's some kind of bacteria in there. And the doctor was very reluctant, but the woman insisted and she did have a biopsy and she had an anaerobic bacteria that in her uterus that was causing these um, uh, recurrent miscarriages and inability to conceive. So she was treated with a, a pretty intense course of antibiotics for a month and then she restored her gut. We have to remember, we always have to take care of the gut. And mm -hmm. then a month later, so it took three months, she was able to conceive and had a baby. Wow. And that was the, you know, uh, that was a case of quote, unexplained infertility, uh, end quote, explained. So um, I want to really encourage women and couples, if you have that diagnosis to think, you know, I need to up level my, my consultation. I need to see an acupuncturist. I need to see a functional medicine or a naturopath. I need to figure out what quote unquote unexplained means because there's probably a reason I just don't know what it is yet. Mm -hmm. I love it. I, I love this interview. I just, you just talked from bottom of my heart. Uh, I really relate because uh, I had the same issues. I had the same struggles. And I think these days they have to change these functions because uh, sometimes you go, you have a, you're, you're a struggling, you go there to fertility centers and you start IVF without curing the root of your body. Right. And then uh -huh. you, expand, uh, you spend a lot of money just because you want to get conceived and then still that problem there and i think something should be changed something um, like fundamentally should be changed instead of sending you to fertility centers a straightforward is good i mean is is not a bad thing because you can have a full diagnosis of your reproductive functions but they should go to functional medicine or uh, as you said natural naturopath or acupuncture to have a full body checkup. And well, there they, are in the, yeah. in the Bay area, there's a lot of um, fertility centers and I know of other major fertility centers in major cities. They always refer for acupuncture for their fertility support. So IVF and acupuncture and Chinese medicine uh, go hand in hand and there are many acupuncturists who have become specialists in supporting fertility. Yes, but you know, there is, a, there is no link between them. People go there if they want. And th these uh, science still not really known in this world. Like when I talk about acupuncture with my friends, some of them they don't understand they don't really believe in it you know but uh, i think there is there is there should something should be changed there i don't know <laughs> there's quite a few studies yeah. if you look in pubmed there are quite a few studies about acupuncture benefits in uh, supporting ivf and fertility and mm -hmm. uh, especially in china they do a lot of studies uh about acupuncture and chinese medicine and I know that at UCSF here, they, they are doing studies constantly about acupuncture and uh, support of different diseases. And so I think it's becoming more accepted within the medical profession. And, but, you know, it really depends where you live. And I think what you're doing here and bringing your work to the world through your interviews and your uh, summit really help expand people's knowledge. And mm -hmm. the beauty of the internet is we can reach people all over the world. Good. So how the pandemic has impacted our feelings and how, yeah, especially about the fertility? Well, I think the fertility journey is difficult by itself, period. There's feelings of isolation, and despite an intellectual acknowledgement of this, women often feel like they've, quote, failed 
or something is the matter with their bodies, um, even if they're in a partnership and it's not, you know, you're, who, who is at fault here? If it's a straight couple, is it the man? Is it the woman? Is it the combination of the two? Or if you're using frozen sperm and you're unable to conceive, is it the sperm? Is it the woman? Is it the fact that the sperm is frozen? I mean, there's a lot of unknowns. And I think we're raised, uh, you know, thinking all your life you need to use birth control. If you're in, uh, in a heterosexual relationship, you don't want to get pregnant. And then you stop using birth control and you think, oh, I'm going to get pregnant right away. And when it doesn't happen for three to six months, then you begin to think, oh, there's a problem. And a lot of people are starting uh, their families much later than they used to. So by the time they realize there's a, quote, fertility difficulty, they can be already in their late 30s or early 40s. And then we're getting into how long are we going to use natural methods or, uh, before we go to IVF? Um, or I've had s people come in and they've had seven intrauterine inseminations. And that, in my opinion, was a waste of seven months because now they're seven months older and nothing has happened. So I think that it really is a good idea to get someone such as myself on board as soon as possible. We have perspective on what's reasonable and what's standard. And I don't think any doctor's office should be doing seven IUIs. And that's just a waste of months for that couple, um, especially when the woman is older. So it helps to have an advocate. The journey is difficult. And now with COVID, it's become more difficult. I know the fertility centers here in the Bay Area, initially they stopped doing IVFs and inseminations until they were able to get their safety precautions dialed in 100%. And now I know the facilities where I refer my patients to, it's, I'm extremely impressed. I mean, they have these small pods of the doctor with the four nurses, and they all are together, and they're separate, and they're isolated. So if, God forbid, somebody would test positive, it would only be within those four people. It wouldn't be within the entire office. And they really, they've ramped up testing. Everybody is tested every week. They have extremely scientific, cleanly air, antiviral cleaning protocols. So I've gone into these facilities to do acupuncture during an insemination. And it's, I've been extremely impressed. I mean, you feel safe and clean and you don't need to worry that there's some like viral thing floating around in the air or on a surface that hasn't been cleaned. And I think that when women want to get pregnant and if they're older, and I was an older mom myself, one of the basic things that we can do is to really up our level of nutrition and supplements. Mm -hmm. And Knowing that the standard American diet, whether it's for fertility or Hashimoto's, or you want to boost your immune system, or you have diabetes or cholesterol problems or weight issues, or even breast cancer, the standard American diet is not okay for people <laughs> across the board. So when we start with that, and we begin to work backwards. Well, what do I need to do to get out of this standard American diet of too much processed food, too many carbohydrates, too much sugar, too much alcohol, uh, too much gluten? Mm. So I think we all need to revamp how we're eating. And that's really important for fertility. It's also important for your immune system support. I, uh, I've heard about um, Brazilian nuts. They said it's really good for fertility, is it right? Selenium, it has selen Brazil nuts have selenium in there. And if you eat six Brazil nuts every day, you're getting 200 micrograms 
of selenium, and that's very good for your um, for anti cancer. It's good for your thyroid. It's good for your immune system. Um, I'm not. I didn't particularly hear that it's specific for anti COVID, but eating Brazil nuts every day is just one of the healthy things that you can do to support mm -hmm. your body. That's great. What about um, hemp seed? These are my uh, uh, fertility diets, and I. I accept it as my lifestyle and I continued and I really enjoyed it. And why, why were you doing hemp? Hemp seed. Yeah, hemp seeds. Mm -hmm. I, I usually recommend flax and chia seeds mm -hmm. um, for the essential oils with the flax, with the EFAs. Um, I'm not a big hemp seed person, but they do have you know healing properties and good oils in them, good fats in them. Chia seed, yeah, chia seed is good too, yeah. Yeah, but flax seeds specifically. Now, the thing about flax is they ha it has a linoleic acid and the bre there's two different types of flax seed. There's a lighter flax seed and a brownish flax seed. And you want to get the darker flax seeds. Um, I recommend you buy them, of course, organic and you get them in bulk. And when you get them home, you want to put them in a glass jar and put them in the freezer. And then uh, the day that you use them, you buy yourself a coffee grinder that you're only going to use for your nuts and your seeds. You take one or two tablespoons, you put them in your, co your coffee grinder, which is only used for your seeds. And then you add them directly to your healing smoothie or your shake, or you can put them in your yogurt or applesauce in the morning. And then you're giving yourself a lot of linoleic acid, which is a very positive fat and an anti-inflammatory agent. What about honey? Because I try to, uh, I, I cut my, I cut sugar many years ago, but instead I use honey, I use dates a lot. <laughs> uh, and I use, um, what do you call it? Grape juice or the, this is a- Concentrate. Yeah, concentrated grape juice. I use it a lot. <laughs> Okay, well, there's something called the Warburg effect. Mm -hmm. And the Warburg effect, the Otto Warburg was a scientist and he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1931. He discovered this in 1924 that cancer cells, when given a choice between sugar and oxygen, they will choose sugar, glucose, mm -hmm. even though it means they get less energy. So, Sugar, even if it's from honey or grape juice concentrate or dates, uh, drives inflammation. So if you have a serious disease such as cancer or Hashimoto's or any type of inflammatory condition, I think it's very important to really limit sugar, even if it's, quote, natural from honey. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and concentrated grape juice is just very high in glycemic index. And I, you know, dates are part of your culture and I can see eating one or two of them in something every now and then, but to eat three dates a day is getting a lot of sugar and dates are delicious. It's very easy to eat them. I love dates. Yeah, I use maybe one, two dates, not every day, but this grape juice I added to uh tahini tahini oh. yeah just just a little bit um one third a spoon of a uh, teaspoon and that's oh, it. that's nothing that's nothing it just yeah oh you know and it's so interesting when you change your diet and you change your lifestyle after some time your body doesn't accept sugar so no i cannot eat cookies I don't enjoy it anymore. That's interesting. Before I used to eat all these cakes, cookies, you know, I don't enjoy it. And my stomach uh, get upset when I uh, eat sugar. So that's good for me. <laughs> yeah. I used to be um, a chef and a pastry chef and I love to bake. So I have taken a lot of my recipes and turned them into gluten-free and very low glycemic. And every holiday season, I publish a new um, recipe book with uh, easy to make. Wow. I mean, you don't want to deprive yourself, but you also can't eat like a, 
normal, whatever that means, unhealthy, normal American standard diet pastry. And we all need to get away from eating that way. It's creating a lot of problems health-wise in our culture. I saw some of your recipes. Oh, <laughs> good. PDF. Yeah, that's, good. that's free for my audience. They can yes. use it. I love it. Yes. Good, I'm glad. So you use uh, dates, right? I do. There's a, my date nut recipe is in there, yes. And you don't need to add any sugar to that because no, the dates... No, that's fine. That's because a delicious dates, cake. If, if you have one or two, it has lots of uh, good things in it. Yeah. Because Fiber. Yeah, the, the vitamins in dates, you can't find in any other fruits because it's a combination of lots of vitamins. Yeah, there's a lot of zinc and vitamin A in dates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think dates are wonderful food. Yeah, I have it with walnuts. Dates yeah, and dates and walnuts, excellent. Yeah, you know, I really don't want to hang up. I love it. I learn a lot today. It's wonderful to be here with you. I, I enjoy my audience also. Love it. A hundred percent they do. And um, do you have any other recommendation or you're going to add something? Do you have any online program or something you're going to offer to my audience? Sure. Um, I, first of all, you can always reach out to me. You, I have a contact me page on my practice website and that is www.carollaurie.com. And I'm very responsive to all emails I get. Um, I want to say that there are four tips that women can use for their fertility and also right now how to eat during this pandemic time. And the first, as I said, is to remove yourself from as much as possible from the concept of the standard American diet. That's number one. Um, the majority of that is not healthy or helpful and is filled with fake food, empty calories and bad fats and contributes to disease. And I talk about that in the free gift that I'm offering uh, to your community now. The second is removing all processed sugars, as we just discussed. And the third is to add foods that have lots of antioxidants in them and uh, phytonutrients. And you can find those foods very easily when you eat purple foods, such as prunes, Blueberry. blueber blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, not so much strawberries because they're very acid. And of course, all of those need to be organic. And in the healing smoothie that I talk about in my practice and in my program, um, we have we put in a half a cup of blueberries every day, whether they're, of course, they're organic, they could be fresh or frozen, it doesn't matter. And then we want to make sure that your food is organic when at all possible so that you're not inputting chemicals from sprays into your body. And the last tip is to talk about your microbiome diversity. And the microbiome is the environment inside of our gut. And lately, I'd say over the last 10, 15 years, there's been a lot of studying about what is gut health? How does gut health impact your immune system, your fertility, your hormones, all of that? And one of the ways that we can take care of our gut health is to eat something very simple like a tablespoon or two of sauerkraut every day. Sour cream? Sauerkraut. Sauerkraut. Oh, okay. Sauerkraut is fermented cabbage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And or go to the health food store and get a dairy-free probiotic. And you want to vary the brand that you take. So one month you'll take brand A and one month you'll take brand B. And that way you'll get different strains of the probiotics or the prebiotics in your gut. Um, you can also make sure that it is in the refrigerator section of the health food store. And you just need to take one of those a day. And if you do those two things, eat a tablespoon or two of sauerkraut or pickles every day and take a pro or prebiotic every day, 
you will really do a lot, go a long way to help the microbiome diversity inside your gut. Your gut will be working at a higher level. You'll be able to break down your hormones easier and you'll be able to talk about your vitamin D, which is broken down a lot in your gut. So it's all related. Okay, you said pickle. I'm of, uh, pickle is healthy? Is it good? Uh, yeah, organic dill, sour pickles. Yes, without, made without sugar. Not, not the kind that's made with sugar. No, just with the vinegar. Yes, yeah, fermented. Oh, I didn't know. I, I thought it's not a good food. No, it's a good food. Oh, okay, I have two um, additional questions. <laughs> I don't sure. want to hang up because I, you are so resourceful and you have lots of knowledge. First of all, uh, why when you want to get pregnant, they ask you to uh, lo lose weight? In my case, I lost two kilos before pregnancy and I, I feel that it, it worked. Two so, kilos is uh, eight pounds? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Two kilos you, is eight pounds. Yeah. 2.2. Four pounds. 2.2 point two. Four four pounds, four yes. po two times two is, yeah, uh, four point. It's about five pounds. Mm -hmm. Only five pounds? Oh. Um, okay. If you're, it depends how much weight. Five pounds shouldn't make that much of a difference. But I've had women come into my practice who are 40 or 50 pounds overweight. And there's a couple things going on. First of all, if you're that, if you have that much extra weight on you, and this is not about an attitude that all women should be skinny or whatever. And you know, the culture in America is that women need to be tall and anorexic and skinny. I mean, I'm not tall and I'm not anorexic and I'm never going to be that person. And I think it does a disservice to have only one body type in advertising, but thank goodness that's change, changing, not fast enough if you ask me. But if you are 20 to 50 or more overweight, there's a couple things going on. One, you, the added weight makes extra hormones. There's extra estrogen in your body, and that's going to make it difficult to conceive. Number two, you're physiologically unhealthy. Um, there's probably too much glucose, sugar floating around. You have unhealthy eating habits somehow. Your gut microbiome is not doing well. It's dysbiotic, it's disorganized, it needs help. Your thyroid may be off, out of balance. And you also have to realize that no matter what weight you are now, when you get pregnant, you're going to gain between 25 and 40 pounds. So if you're 40 pounds overweight and you gain another 40 pounds, that's an extra, a lot of extra weight to be carrying on your body. So I think that the doctors want you to succeed in your fertility. And a lot, I get referrals from the IVF doctors and they have a cutoff of overweight uh, before they'll work with the woman and they refer the women to me and the woman comes in and says, you know, the doctor says I need to lose 25 pounds before I can get IVF. So I, they want, they want good statistics, but they also want their work to be successful. They want to optimize the health of the woman so she can receive the implantation. And I am a big supporter of, um, being healthy in your body. And it doesn't matter what the number on the scale is, it matters how, what your health level is. And if you are 25 to 50 pounds overweight, you're not physiologically healthy. Or it's mm. difficult to be physiologically healthy if you're that overweight, I should say. I love this, because <laughs> I always thinking why they recommend to lose weight. I was not that much, um, I was always thin, so I didn't have extra weight, but two, I had two kilos extra weight, to my opinion. I was always like 56 kilos something, and then I gained two kilos, I lost it. And uh, it's interesting, after um, giving birth, uh, 10 days after, 
again, I was 56 kilos. <laughs> well, you were very lucky. That wasn't my experience. <laughs> yeah, I was so lucky because I couldn't eat so much. I threw up everything. <laughs> so during my pregnancy, it was very difficult um, to eat for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, another thing about uh, milk and coffee. Why they are not good for um, pregnancy? I've heard you can, um, it's better you cut uh, cheese, all dairy products. That's what I did. And also coffee. Uh, you have to uh, drink less coffee, which I totally cut it. <laughs> so why they create inflammation of her, but why they're not, why they create inflammation, why they're not good? Well, unfortunately, coffee in these days and age can be a coffee drink which has a sugar frappy thing connected to it, which already you're starting your day out and you're eating sugar and probably a pastry. And then your glycemic load is going to go way up off the chart. I mean, you don't want to start your day with that. Individually, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing for a woman to have a cup of coffee uh, every day, once a day, and maybe not first thing in the morning because it can get your adrenal glands and your fat mobilized. Um, but across the board, if you're having a difficult pregnancy, if you're having a tendency to have premature contractions, you don't want to be putting any stimulant in your body and coffee, caffeine is a stimulant. So we need to be really careful about that. Uh, the green tea is a very healthy uh, drink to drink, but once again, it has caffeine in it. So you need to be really careful. If you're having premature contractions, one of the things the doctor will tell you is no caffeine, no stimulation. So you need to be careful about that. As far as dairy is concerned, it really depends on the woman. Some women are fine. I'm, I don't believe that women need to drink milk. I don't think children need to drink milk. I think uh, drinking cow's milk is, you know, the dairy industry, $20 billion advertising moment. But um, milk does have calcium in it. And there, if you're not going to drink milk, then you need to know clearly how are you going to supplement your, with different foods and your products of your calcium to support your bones with boron and vitamin D and vitamin K. Um, Goat cheese is a very good thing to eat. Some people eat goat cheese. Some people eat sheep cheese like feta. Uh, Cow's milk cheese, not so great, but it's individual. And uh, some people are, some women are okay with it during pregnancy and some women are not. If you have a tendency to get coughs and colds and have a lot of mucus in your lungs, or if you have asthma, obviously you want to stay away from dairy because dairy makes mucus. So I didn't know that. No, really. Yes. So once again, it's a very individual process. Because I also have asthma. (laughs) Oh, then you should not be eating dairy. But it's interesting because, um, no, I don't. Because sometimes it happens. And uh, that's what you say. Probably that's, that was the problem. If you have uh, cheese and dairy products, your asthma getting worse. Yeah. Because during those times in my pregnancy, I didn't have too much problem for my asthma. Because mm-hmm. I never take um, dairy products during pregnancy. All right. Uh, my question never ends. <laughs> Good. It's, it's, Lovely, lovely to talk to you. A few uh, homeopathic remedies to use. This is the last question. Sure. <laughs> All right. What homeopathic remedies to use for what kind of problem? What do we want to address? Um, yeah, you say a few homeopathic remedies to use for fertility. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, let's just say that homeopathic remedies are very specific for your symptoms. And um, I know I talked about using a few for fertility, but I'm just going to talk about one or two. Um, 
one, and it, I really encourage people to find a homeopath to consult. Homeopathy is easily done by Zoom. Um, you don't have to, you know, see the person in his or her office and have your case taken because I've helped women who have had like gushing periods where their doctor was going to put them on hormones and a homeopathic remedy with changing their diet and doing acupuncture and taking some supplements within a month totally turned it around. So once again, it's a whole system of healing. It's not just one thing um, when you have a serious condition that works towards optimizing your health. So there's one remedy, it's called sepia, and it's S-E-P-I-A, and it's the ink from the cuttlefish. So what the remedy sepia has to do, it, it's a very feminine remedy. It has a lot to do with uterine complaints, uterine cramping, too much bleeding, and the woman can be in a weeping and depressed state, uh, difficult conception, and it's also used for the postpartum period when the baby has been born and she might be having continuous bleeding from her uterus. But there are lots of emotional symptoms connected to this remedy, and there's a lot of different physical symptoms too. So the remedy, com the remedy symptoms are very specific. Another really good remedy that I've used for women during um, pregnancy, during fertility, is the remedy pulsatilla. And pulsatilla is a plant. Sorry, I interrupted. Uh, Sorry. Uh, the first remedy? Sepia. Sepia. Oh, is it a medicine? Is it a herb? Or what is this? Sepia is a homeopathic remedy. I'm seeing if I have any here near me and the remedies are, are are going to come in these little vials and they're going to look like these tiny little oh, pellets like it peels like tiny 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 pellets mm -hmm. and even if the pellets look the same it could be a different remedy because the pellets are made and then the remedy is dropped on the pellets. And then the pellets taste sweet, and you just tap a few into the inside of the cap. You don't want to touch them with your fingers. And you put them in your mouth and let them dissolve under your tongue. And homeopathic remedies are wonderful for children as well as adults and even animals because there's, by the time a substance gets to the point of being a homeopathic remedy, it has been potentized. And there's no live molecular product. There's no live biology in it. It's just the energy of the substance, which is what makes homeopathy such a wonderful method of healing and which is why it is safe no matter what kind of medication you're on because you're not taking anything that will interfere with the medication or if a woman is nursing, it's fine for the mom as well as the babe. Wow, I love this. You said, so you, mm, you were going to talk about the second one. Yes, pulsatilla. Uh -huh. Pulsatilla is a plant. It's a beautiful plant. And the symptom picture of pulsatilla is there'll be a lot of weeping. The woman will be weeping one minute, and the next minute she'll feel fine. So there's changeability in affect and mood. And then there is the symptom of wanting, not doing well with uh, closed rooms. You have to have fresh air. The, the door, the window has to be opened and she'll be warm. And I know you're thinking, well, what difference does that make? So I've gone into the room of somebody who was sick and they were lying there and the window was open and they uh, kept throwing their covers off and they wanted little sips of water, and one minute they were crying, and the next minute they were fine, and I just looked at those symptoms, and I gave the woman pulsatilla, and her fever broke, and she, her appetite came back, and she began to get better. I mean, so the symptoms 
are the symptoms that of it's the way the body is expressing the disease it doesn't necessarily matter what the diagnosis is i love it too much <laughs> resource here so i uh, maybe i just uh, try to divide this in two parts because i didn't want to end up for 30 minutes i want to you can do whatever you want yes. you know, i'm with my audience having such a great really time enjoy your talk that was amazing because lots of i learned a lot today well i'm happy to be here it's really a pleasure yeah. to hang out with you thank you carol for being here and uh, be part of this project and podcast as well and uh, thank you for your free offer of your recipes and nutrition mm -hmm. pdf I'm going to share it with my audience. Perfect. I can't wait for your audience yeah. to receive it. And please reach out if anyone has any questions. Yes. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day, everyone. You too.